Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and first time ever guest producer Andrew is here. It's very exciting. Yeah, I thought you were saying he was a ghost or something. <laughs> well, no, he's right beside you. Right, but I mean, he could be an illusion. <laughs> or one of those, uh, like the ghost that I saw that didn't look like a ghost. That was just a solid form. Sure. A.K.A. a ghost. Yeah, we could use more ghost producers. <laughs> we could. You know? Yeah. Don't have to pay um, benefits? No. Are you don't dead? have to do anything. Yep. You just, Pretty just great. go. Press a button and <laughs> and die. Oh. So, um, Chuck. Yes. I don't know if you remember several months ago, we released <laughs> an episode. And it was a good one, if uh-huh. you ask me. Yeah. And it was about search and rescue. Okay. Do you yes. remember the episode? SAR. Right. And then there was like you SAR, urban search and rescue, wilderness search and rescue. And in that episode, I was like, man, we have to do an episode on search and rescue dogs. Well, by God, today is the day we're doing it. The only time we've ever followed up on a promise in our career. (laughs) The prophecy has been fulfilled. That's right. So we're talking today about search and rescue dogs. And this, first of all, this article is just genuine, bona fide How Stuff Works quality from the olden days. Yeah, just checks all those boxes, doesn't it? Every box. That's that's Mark 1 in the favor of this episode, that it's based on that article. Mark 2 is that uh, it's about dogs and how much, how great dogs are. And I just had a really good time researching this one. Yeah, it's funny, like, during reading this whole thing and all this research in my head, I just kept thinking, good boy, good girl. Mm Mm-hmm. I just kept saying that over and over. Yeah, just petting them behind the ears, playing oh, with them yeah, in your mind. So um, when we're talking about SAR dogs, we're talking about search and rescue dogs, dogs that are trained to go find people, right? Mm-hmm. They do two things. There's two components to a search and rescue dog's job. It is to find people and then to let their handler know that they found the person, right? Sure, because if a dog <clears throat> that just finds someone doesn't let anyone know, Right. They'll, they'll just be sitting around licking faces all day. Right. You're like, yes, you you found me. Now no, go get help. And the dog's like, mm, I don't know. Although I did like seeing, what was that one uh, dog called that's trained to uh, to like stay there instead of going to, to alert everyone else? A victim loyalty is that behavior. Yeah. And I think that's the case if there's, if like someone is injured, they may need that dog to just stay there and start barking instead sure. of saying, hey. I'm going to run and find someone and let and let them know that you're not okay. Right. So, what, however they alert, as long as they alert, that's good. That's the second part of the job. As long as they don't wander off and, like, find a craps game to engage in without telling anybody that they found the person who's stranded in the wilderness, right? Which would not happen with a SAR dog because they can focus like nobody's business. Right, right. So, SAR dogs are professional working dogs, right? Just as much as like a a herding dog on a farm who actually does that work um, or a canine unit dog or one of the Beagle Brigade. We've talked about them before. It's a a working dog. But the the article that Julia Layton wrote points out, and I think really just kind of changed my perspective on things and opened up my eyes, that what the dog is really doing is playing. Yeah. Right? So... I mean, the dog is not taking work seriously, even though it appears to be it's taking play seriously. And I just love that. Yeah. And and it really hit home to me, too, like uh, when it pointed out that um, if you've ever had a dog that will like run till their paws are bloody to get that mm-hmm. tennis ball mm-hmm. or that Kong. Right. Um, I guess I just name checked a brand. They should throw some dough for that. It's a good brand, though. Uh, Mo- Momo then... <laughs> loves the little Kong balls, the tiny ones. <laughs> oh, uh, those tiny ones are so cute. Mm-hmm. Um, that 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 would make a good SAR dog. And I have had two dogs mm-hmm. in my life that would be great uh, search and rescue dogs. My dog oh, yeah. uh, Buckley, who is no longer with us, and my current one of my two current dogs, Nico, and they both had a lot of Staffordshire Terrier in them. And they both, from day one, if you threw something. Ran and got it, brought it back, dropped it at your feet, and looked at you as if 
if you don't throw that thing again, I might keel over and die right now. <laughs> Staffordshire Terrier, isn't that Spuds McKenzie? No. Oh. <laughs> I, I can't remember what kind of uh, terrier that is. but It was some kind of terrier, and I thought it was an English countryside village named terrier. But, huh. I mean, staffies are, I think a lot of people throw a lot of dogs into the pit bull category that aren't uh-huh. pit bulls. That's kind of a... A bone uh, of contention with pit bull owners sure. is like, you know, a dog attacks that has any a terrier in it, and they say it was a pit bull. Um, right. So staffies are lumped in there. But I, I remember when we did uh, one of my great memories of being in Edinburgh uh, <laughs> on our tour, yeah. was I, I took a walk around lovely, uh, the lovely town, and I ran into a lady who was walking one of hers. And, you know, when you're out of town and you're not with your dog, you just sort of, yes. like, attack every dog you see. Totally. And so I got down, and I was with this dog, and I was like, oh, I love this dog. You're, you know, your dog's so sweet or something. And she went, just a wee staffy. <laughs> That's so Scottish. A wee staffy. That was a, uh, that, that like, that town is magnificent. It's magic. It really is. I can't wait to go back one day. Yeah, we need to do that. We need to get on another UK tour. I could not agree more, dude. Heck Yeah. Okay, it's done. We're doing it. Look for uh, <laughs> it in, in like two years or three years if it's anything like our Australia tour. So uh, with the SAR dogs, though, um, we cannot emphasize any more how much time is of the essence because uh, whether it is, and we'll get into the various types of rescues, but they're all pretty time sensitive, whether it's a missing child, God forbid, or a collapsed building, God forbid, or an avalanche, God forbid. (laughs) None of these situations are awesome. And the clock is ticking, especially, you know, in in those cases where, you know, there's maybe short of oxygen or they're buried in snow, like minutes count. Yeah, for sure. I saw on a site uh, from an organization that offers SAR dog training um, for your dog. Like, if you think your dog's got it, they say, Mm -hmm. come, we'll we'll find out if your dog's got it. They were saying, like— you have to be out there, like, you You have to treat this like you're an ambulance, basically. Right. When you get the call, you got to be out the door. And it's interesting, you know, the dog doesn't have any job other than search and rescue, so the dog's ready to go anytime. Oh, yeah. But you're their handler, and they live with you, and you have to be out there with them. So you have to be able to leave your regular job at the drop of a hat. And, and star dog handlers are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so much that um, the dogs go on vacation with the handlers in case there's a call. Yeah. And you both have to go show up somewhere together. So you have to be very, very responsive. And it is, like you're saying, because time is of the essence, because the, this article gives the uh, example of avalanche victims. Oh, man. Like, if you're an avalanche victim, if you're covered in an avalanche, you probably will not want to be thinking about these stats. But most avalanche victims uh, who are found within, I think, is it 10 minutes or 15 minutes? I think 90% of the victims are alive at 15 minutes. Okay, great. What about 35 minutes, Chuck? (laughs) Uh, 30%. Right. So So between 15 and 35 minutes... 60% 60% of the of, of those folks will be gone. Right. And so you you might say, well, okay, but wait, wait. You guys are talking about an avalanche. How's a dog going to find you in an avalanche? Dogs can find you covered in snow. Dogs can find you underwater. Mm-hmm. Dogs can pick up your scent sometimes when you're 500 meters away. Right. It's yeah, amazing. I, I was surprised to hear that because you always see in like those old-timey chain gang movies – um, you know, that are my favorite genre, obviously. <laughs> sure. When, when they're trying to elude the tracking dogs, they cross a, a river or something like that to yeah. throw them off the scent. And that probably works for, for tracking dogs. And we'll talk about the difference between these dogs. But for for a scent dog, um, they can they can be trained to find your scent underwater, especially if you just happen to be decomposing. Yeah, and especially if that dog is a bloodhound. Um, Mm -hmm. And in those old-timey movies that you love, it seems like it's always a bloodhound or, you know, a pack of bloodhounds. And the the dude, you know, who just escaped from prison is runs through the river. And usually in the movie, they're they're like, you know, drat it all. They just (laughs) threw us off the scent. Right, somebody throws their hat to the ground. <laughs> it's Walter funny Brennan. because of those kind of because of that whole thing, that whole um that genre or whatever, that mm-hmm. prison escape thing. I unfairly associate bloodhounds with scary backwoods like redneck police officials. Yeah, yeah. 
You know what I'm saying? Because they're always with them. But that that doesn't mean that the bloodhounds are scary. No, they're great. Sure. Good old hound dogs. Yeah. Elvis wrote a song about them. Yeah, but it wasn't favorable. Uh, that's true. You know, lying all the time. I wonder, but Elvis wasn't talking about dogs. No, but he was comparing somebody who he didn't have in a high opinion or high esteem to a hound dog. I wonder who that was about. And he probably had no idea that he was giving them quite a compliment. Right. He was he was trying to do the opposite. It was like that Simpsons where somebody calls uh, somebody else a chicken and a chicken in a top hat appears and goes, he's insulting the <laughs> both of us. They uh, Elvis should have said, you ain't nothing but a hound dog which is actually the most talented scent dog of all time. Right. That would have fit, too. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. I hold you in deep admiration. <laughs> and there goes the career of Elvis Presley. Yep. Uh, so, smell-wise, dogs have a sense of smell about 40 times stronger than a human. <laughs> and this is all dogs. It doesn't mean all dogs make good star dogs, but just because little Momo is, uh, you know, like a little curly, cute lap dog yes. doesn't mean that I mean, Momo may not be a good star dog for obvious reasons, but that doesn't mean Momo can't smell a dead body in the ocean. <laughs> no, and she does. She just, she goes and finds a game of craps instead of telling anybody about it. That's because that's how you've trained her. Sure. Now, Momo would not be a very good star dog. She would be a little sketched out on the scene of a, a search and rescue mission. But she could, she, and she does, I'm sure, Pick up on the rafts, R A T. I'm sorry, R A F T S, which is uh, it's gross, but these are the dead skin cells mm -hmm. that are constantly flying off of our body yep. that smell only like uh, us. Yeah, that's, like every individual. Apparently, this is not proven, but they think they know that humans shed skin cells, rafts, and that they do have a scent, a human specifically human scent, and that is specific to each person, too, which is all totally believable. Yeah, which is why they, you know, like in the movies, they give somebody an old sweatshirt that that person mm -hmm. wore the day before, right? and that's how they know how to go look for that person. Right, they'll they'll do that. They'll mash it in the dog's face and then go find it, and they they find <laughs> the whatever the person that smells like that. So they think that's how dogs are able to find specific human scents or any human scent is that the rafts, the skin cells that we're shedding, are being picked up. We leave them behind on the ground. They fall to the ground. Um, if we run up against a bush or something, a bunch of them get scraped off, or they're just kind of floating in the air. And depending on the type of dog, um, they're going to pick up those skin cell rafts. And and it's probably about here that we should say that there are two types, two general umbrella categories of um, search and rescue dogs. There's the tracking dog mm -hmm. and there's the air scent dog. And they do the same thing. They find humans, but they do it in two very different ways. One super targeted and one super general. And depending on the situation that you're faced with, you're going to call in one dog or the other, or maybe both if you're just a a, a county that's just flush with extra taxpayer cash that you don't know what to do with. Sure, dog county. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so a tracking dog, uh, they also call those following dogs. Those are like when you think of a bloodhound with their nose down on a trail. Right. Uh, they're the ones who, who know, and this is what these dogs need. They know the, the last seen point of this person. So like, you know, if you went uh, hiking in the woods and you parked your car at a trailhead, Right. Uh, they know that that is your last, if that is in fact your last scene point. That is the last scene point. Here is a, a sweater that they wore yesterday and uh, go at it. Right. And we talked about the nuts and bolts of that kind of stuff on the search and rescue episode. So go listen to that because we talked about the last scene point and we talked about how searchers re like fan out from there. And sure. There's like a quick response team. The dogs are the ones that are brought out first because a scent, if it's a tracking dog and they're following the scent that was specifically laid down by that person, yeah. that tracking dog needs to be there very quickly and they need to... Um, they need to be there before everybody else because yes. once a bunch of searchers get into the area and start searching for the person, they, they don't know where the person's scent trail is. So they might be crossing all over it and ultimately ruin it for the dog who can't pick it up anymore. So that tracking dog is going to be among the first searchers on the scene. That's right. Uh, the air scent dogs, uh, like you said, th these are a little more like when you don't know, like somebody's just lost in the forest or somebody's buried 
uh, in the snow. Mm-hmm. They don't have that last scene starting point. Uh, and they basically just say, go out there and stick your nose in the air uh, instead of on the ground and see if you can inhale some of those so some of those airborne rafts mm-hmm. like fine 70s cocaine. <laughs> right. The finest. Qu- Cuervo gold and the fine Colombian. Uh, and those, you know, that's basically basically their deal. Um, you know, if th- th- it's a little more general, um, you're, you're probably some sort of a, well, there are all kinds of dogs, but you're not small. You're medium-sized or larger. Uh, you may be a German shepherd or like a lab. Mm-hmm. Believe, uh, believe it or not, it's probably not a St. Bernard um, just because they're – they're just a little too big these days. Yeah, cumbersome is how this article put it. Border collies are good. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, the bloodhound, because they're those big old ears and all those cute folds in their faces yep. actually concentrate scent particles right into those uh, stinky, stinky, drippy nostrils. Yeah, it just kind of slaps the, the the skin cells of humans right into the dog's nostrils. Amazing. So let's take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk about different specialties that a search and rescue dog can have, okay? Woof. Okay, Chuck, so we're back. We are talking now, if you'll follow me Mm -hmm. in this line of thinking, about the different specialties search and rescue dogs can have. Go. Yeah, this one is uh, sort of the saddest specialty, but the the cadaver dog, um, very, very important, though, because, you know, people need closure in their lives. And if you've lost a loved one, uh, literally lost a loved one, and you don't know where they are, and they end up not surviving that uh, ordeal, then you would still like to give them um, a burial of your choice or, you know, however you want to do things in your family. But <laughs> Wow, that was, that was a lot. Well, I was saying a proper burial, but that means a lot of things to a lot of people. Sure. Could be a sky burial. Sure, it could be. Remember those? Oh, yeah, that was a great one. I don't remember what that was on, but that was a good one. Buzzards, right? Just picking at your body. Yep, up in the Himalayas. Uh, so they are they are specifically trained to search for human remains, and those uh, decomposition gases, uh, and those skin rafts still. But uh, that that is pretty amazing because these dogs can find it says a single human tooth or a single drop of blood they can detect. Right, right. Because you know, first of all, they're they're naturally um, able to to detect that kind of stuff. But then the training they receive really kind of narrows and, and focuses that, that natural ability they have. Yeah. But when when I was looking up cadaver dogs, as of course I did, I was like, how would you train a cadaver dog? What are you, where are you getting the dead bodies? Body farm? Uh, apparently, if you are training cadaver dogs, you can apply to get, like, decomposing human tissue. Wow. You have to, you have to, like, get a license for it, I believe, or a license to have it. Um but apparently it's hard to come by, so trainers will, like, use their own blood oh, wow. to train dogs to find blood. There's also a company um, that makes a uh, scent, of an artificial training scent called Sigma Pseudo Corp Scent. Oh, God. And it comes in three flavors, uh, recently deceased, decomposing, and drowned. Wow. And you can train a dog— on this, um, on this scent, it's close enough approximation that they will learn to follow the scent and find decomposing human remains. So, two people uh, buy those creeps, uh, creeps and uh, SAR trainers, right? And uh, like, it, but just two people buy the bottles. They're like a million dollars each. Yeah, and they go out on a Tinder date, and they're like, just a little dab of drowned <laughs> body behind each ear. Ooh la la! And I'm all set. Yeah. Uh, all right, water dogs are the next, and those uh, search for drowning victims, obviously. Uh, they are generally in a boat at some point, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about their training. But one of the one of the big parts of training is to make sure that these SAR dogs can ride in helicopters and ride in boats and ride mm-hmm. on a, 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 a snowmobile. 
or whatever, you know, an ATV. What are those things called? <laughs> yeah, ATV. <laughs> Four wheelers. Remember, yeah. they had three wheelers when we were kids. Man, those are so dangerous. Yeah, everyone's like, man, these things sure do tip over a lot. Right. Maybe we should add a fourth wheel. Yeah, there you go. And then now it's stable. And it's, oh, man, those were so dangerous. They, I remember when they came out and it was like 12-year-olds dying all over the place with those things. I never rode one of those. I didn't either. My mom would, would not have let me near one of those. I was a uh, go-karter. Oh, lucky. I had, I didn't have one. You know, we never had any of that stuff because my parents were teachers. <laughs> so they were like, draw a picture of one. <laughs> um, but my my really good friend growing up lived out in the in the woods in the country, and he had two sort of homemade go karts. Uh, not sort of homemade; they were totally homemade. Uh, they weren't like the, the you know the super sweet things you could buy, right? But they had the land where their dad built like a dirt track, and it was the most fun thing I ever did as a child. That's awesome. It was awesome. Yeah, it was always the friend out in the country that had the go karts. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not a city folk. Right. So, I mean, if you have a really specialized um, SAR dog, maybe it is used to riding in a go-kart too, but it's going to definitely be trained to, to ride in on just about anything that it will be called in for. Yeah. And in addition, Chuck, this is amazing to me. They are totally fine with being lowered down the face of a cliff in a harness on a rope. Yeah. Stuff like that. Like they're trained to, um, as we'll see, they're trained to basically – keep it together in some very weird situations for dogs. Yeah, and again, with my dog Nico, the the Staffy, uh, I have, you know, two dogs, and they've both been on boats. And mm-hmm. Charlie, the uh, the Sheltie mix, kind of just hides under seats. Right. Whereas Nico is, we call her the hood ornament. She just mm-hmm. sits as tall as possible, front and center, and her nose is just, I mean, I can't imagine the amount of scents that she's inhaling. Right. It's really impressive. Yeah, we took Momo on a kayak to see what she would do, and she loved it. She did not hide at all. She was uh, alert, barking at fish, anything she could find. (laughs) She was like, yes, this is pretty great. (laughs) That's pretty fun stuff. So there was also, like we said, there's avalanche um, search and rescue dogs. There's also urban disaster search and rescue dogs, and we'll talk about them more in depth in a little while. But suffice to say that that is the... um, the pinnacle of search and rescue dogs. Yeah, that's the toughest one. There are something like, from what I saw, there's maybe a hundred search and rescue dogs in the United States that are officially qualified to search in a, a disaster scenario in an urban area. Yeah, and I know we're going to talk about it in a minute, but there was one part of that section. Oh yeah, that just got me. Like these dogs operate 100 percent on reward mm-hmm. for doing what they're doing, and. Uh, in urban disasters, like apparently a dog can get down if on themselves if they just keep finding dead people. Right. And so at ground zero, there were uh, firefighters and rescuers that would pretend to be uh, people trapped just so that these dogs that have been working long days could feel like they had done something uh, to help. Right. Can you believe that, dude? I totally can. That's just such like a firefighter thing to do. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I love that, too. Uh, All right, so there's wilderness dogs, Mm -hmm. self-explanatory, and then something called evidence article dogs. Yeah, they can find, like, pieces of clothing or or evidence in a a crime. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So go find the bloody hammer. Right. Right, exactly. Wow, that that turned dark all of a sudden. (laughs) It really did. So let's say that you want to start training your dog. Um there, there's, it's actually training a search and rescue dog follows pretty established training principles. And first of all, it's all positive reinforcement. Oh, sure. We, we eventually need to do an episode on like um, negative reinforcement or dog obedience because mm-hmm. it's just so fully discredited, but most people think that, or most people don't realize it. But you, you do not need to punish your dog for not doing something right. You just praise and reward your dog for doing for when they do do something right that's how you train a dog yeah and that's the basis of search and rescue training is it's all positive reinforcement and reward um and the whole thing starts out with just basic obedience and it's at this point that momo would wash out of search and rescue training oh really just right out of the gate right yeah. 
Momo is her own person, uh-huh. and, and we treat her as such, like she's our child. So we don't treat her like a dog. So she has come to not see herself as a dog. Um, she's a very good dog, very sweet and loyal, and takes good care of us. But she um, she would just get distracted and again a little freaked out and sketched out when the when the distractions came around. Yeah, uh, Nico stares at. Um, you know, we're living in a in a rental house right now. Mm-hmm. Because we're we're doing work on our house, so it's yep. a very weird time for our whole family to all of a sudden be uprooted and living in this strange house out in the woods. Yeah, but Nico just sits and stares in the window, uh, which overlooks a big wooded lot. Uh, that just movement, squirrels, mm-hmm. birds, or whatever. And the yep. second you open that door, she's so fast. She's like a greyhound <laughs> bolting for anything. And luckily, she hasn't caught anything yet. But um. I'm telling you, man, she'd be a great star dog. The only reason I would not do this is because I, I want her <laughs> around and not right. on location right? helping people. So I guess, yeah. If, I'm selfish. If, if it were squirrel search and rescue, I think Momo <laughs> would be excellent, <laughs> excellent at it. I, I agree. S-S-A-R? <laughs> yeah. Maybe there is a call for that and we just don't realize it because we don't speak squirrel. So, yes, basic obedience is level one. Um, just regular commands. Temperament is super important. Uh, they have to be good with um, strangers, um, other dogs, obviously. A lot of times there are a bunch of dogs on the scene, and they can't be like, I'm going to go fight that dog or play with that dog. Uh, they have to be good on walks, on loose leashes, but be good with crowds. All of that stuff, I, I imagine, really roots out in training a bunch of dogs right off the bat. Yes, for sure. Um so that's just basic obedience, and you have to you have to just knock that off the list out of the gate. Sure, right. Then you move on to the you you move from you know good, well behaved, obedient dog to now we're starting to get into the training a little bit, and you want to teach your dog um, something really important that apparently comes up in search and rescue mm-hmm. that. You are not the end-all, be-all in the world to this dog. This is this the part dog, I hate. <laughs> th- this dog has to be able to um, to to take instruction from people other than you. Yeah. And to also show a tremendous amount of concentration, self-possession, non-distraction. And the way that they test this usually when they're training search and rescue dogs is they will um, take a dog over to a crowd of other dogs, and there will be other people milling about and all that. And um, you, the handler, will will ask the dog to, to lay down or stay or sit. And the dog, and then you leave, you go away, at least out of sight. I think this article says 30 feet away. And so you, the dog can't see you anymore. And then over the course of 10, 15, 20 minutes, other handlers come in and take over responsibility of tending to this herd of dogs that are all sitting around. Yeah. And if your dog will listen to your command that you gave one time, which is stay here or sit or lay down, whatever, the whole time you're gone until you come back and, and tell them that they can get up or whatever, then that's apparently the test for canine professionalism. Pretty amazing. And I'm sure there's probably a a lot of different tests. There's no standardization for search and rescue dog training except for the FEMA certification for urban search and rescue dogs. Right. Um, so I'm sure there's different tests all over the place, but that's a pretty good glimpse of what you need to expect from your dog to to surpass the, the second level, the second echelon, and move on to the third one. Yeah, the second is, one is tough. The second one's tough. I think the third one is is genuinely tough. Not not necessarily for you training the dog. I think the third one is the tough one on the dog. Yeah, this is just raw physical and mental ability and agility. So, mm-hmm. I mean, they're going through like an obstacle course, basically. You can go through tunnels. You can climb uh, an uh, incline of more than, uh, I think, a minimum of 45 degrees on each side, yeah. like up and down. You can get into a a cherry picker like we talked about and go up really high without jumping out mm-hmm. or be in that boat or be in that snowmobile or helicopter and not get freaked out. Like <laughs> you have to, you know, they don't crank up the helicopter usually like once you get in that thing. And we've all seen mash. You got to run up to a <laughs> helicopter whose blades are spinning. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to do that. No, no. So, but your dog needs to be able to, like, come on, let's go. I'll, I'll, all the man, I'll man the machine gun. Yeah. Or, hey, get in this harness. I'm going to attach you to my chest, mm-hmm. and we're going to rappel down this mountain, and you just got to be a good boy. Yeah. 
They do. I mean, once they reach a certain level of training, they do. Uh, and then the final is is tracking, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, this is this is after they pass those three levels, but um, tracking is uh, urban tracking is level one, like you talked about. That is that's the hardest thing to do, and this test is just off the charts to me. What they have a person do is they will be the target, like the you know the the whatever they're looking for. So they will do a half mile to one mile track from one point to another in a high traffic area of a city. Mm-hmm. Like they'll go to like downtown New York and walk a half mile to a mile. This dog's sitting there the whole time, you know, with someone else. Uh, they have to cross at least two intersections, make at least three <laughs> right angle turns. Right. Go down two blocks of alleyways, leaving, you know, a scent article along the way. Mm-hmm. Like they're at least leaving little nuggets. Shedding off skin cells, I guess. Sure. Or maybe dropping the the comb in your back pocket. Uh, Then once you have laid down that track, another person crosses that track uh, in at least one place. Mm -hmm. So they're adding scent, basically trying to throw this dog off. Right. And then 30 minutes later, after all of this and after the target is at the very end, they finally say, all right, dog, go. And the dog has to find this target in no more time than it took for the person to lay down that track. Right, and like you said, waiting 30 minutes before they start after the person's finished. That's impressive. That is super impressive. And there's distractions the whole way, too. Right, like from, from what I gathered, this is actually done in like a, a, an actual city. Like they don't have like a fake city built somewhere in Colorado or something like that. <laughs> like this is a, like your, your real town this is happening in. Yeah. So the more distractions, the better. Yeah, um, for sure. And they hire people who are wearing like... Um, Dracar Noir and just to wander around everywhere to confuse the scent and everything. It's it's a it's a crazy jam for the dog. That's gross. So let's um actually, man, when's the last time you smelled Dracar Noir? Oh, uh, I don't know, eighty six. <laughs> I have smelled it within the last year, and I got to tell you, it holds up. Maybe even more than it I realized before. <laughs> well, you know how I feel about cologne. Um, so I say we take our second break and then come back and talk about wh- what we've talked about up to this point. is just like basic training. Now we got to get into specialty training. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. We'll be right back. Okay, so Chuck, your dog has been through SAR training or basic basic training for SAR. Yes. But they haven't actually been taught the SAR part yet. It's just, they've just shown like, okay, I got it. I got what it takes. Let's, you know, put me in there. Show me what to do. Yeah. And the way that you, you train a dog to um, search and, and rescue by, sh- by alerting is just basically taking their natural inclinations and, again, like, focusing them and amplifying them. And you do that through reward. And the way that you train a dog through reward, I'm having trouble saying that for some reason, (laughs) is that you identify what that dog wants more in the world than anything else. Yeah. Whether it's a tennis ball, whether it's a a snossages, whatever it is, you figure out what that dog wants, the thing that they will do anything to get, uh, and... That's what you use as their reward. And then you can start the, the SAR search and rescue training. Yeah, and the, the reward is important to, to be consistent with that, <laughs> uh, with that reward because you can't even, uh, and they pointed out, even in horrible situations mm-hmm. like 9-11 or if they find like a, a, your family member, you know, their body out in the woods, mm-hmm. you need to discreetly take this dog off to the side and – give them the reward, and even if that means, you know, a, toss a Frisbee, like, if that's what it is, then that's what you got to do. <laughs> Which would be a really just odd thing to see, somebody playing Frisbee with their dog, with a crying family and a dead body in the woods with the well, bloody think, hammer sticking out of their forehead. <laughs> discreetly is the key word there. I, get, I like don't you think would... you're, like, leaping over the body or anything. <laughs> Like you just find a nearby area and then go kind of discreetly carry out your reward. Let's just hope so. Uh, yeah, so it takes um, 
<laughs> about 600, and this is generalization, of course, but about 600 hours of training, yeah, which is a lot of hours for a dog to be field ready. That's for the dog. Yeah, yeah. The humans have to go through, what, like 1,000 hours? That's what, that's what this article says. Yeah, so that's 1,600 hours of training between humans and dogs. Which is hilarious because it means that humans require more training than the dogs do to do the job. I know. And, they, and like, I don't know, are humans rewarded? Are they like, here's your martini, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, I would crawl through an avalanche to get to a martini. <laughs> I would. That's my reward. That'd be great. So um, you, you, the, the whole way you start this, again, you're using the, their favorite thing in the world as a reward. Mm -hmm. And you teach them that they can go find their reward somewhere. They normally want to find things. So if you show them, okay, come find me is a good way to start. And usually this takes two people. And this article uses avalanche training as an example, but it kind of generally applies to anything. Whatever your whatever specialty you're training your SAR dog to engage in, yeah. that's what that's kind of what you would teach them. So if you if you're training them under avalanche um guidelines, you would go dig a hole in some snow mm -hmm. and in perfect perfect line of sight with the dog, you would go da, 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 and like go run and jump into the hole <laughs> yeah. in the snow. Uh -huh. And you would have your assistant holding the dog back. And then after just a second, after you make it into the hole, they let the dog go and the dog runs after you. And when the dog comes to get you, you just praise it and love on it and give it its ball or its sausages or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And the dog's like, oh, okay. Now, if I go find human I will get played with. I will get a reward, whatever it is that's really important to me. And now the the kernel, the seed of search and rescue training has just been planted in the dog. And dogs are smart, so it doesn't take much more to kind of fluff it up into bona fide, full search and rescue professionalism. Yeah, it's kind of funny because dogs are super smart, but mm -hmm. also very dumb in that, like, <clears throat> it's just a simple... Uh, reward situation. Like, right. find person, get treat. Yeah. And that doesn't mean it, dumb, but that, it's, it's simplistic, I guess. Okay, good. I'm glad you said that because I was going to say, I, it sounds more like dogs have it figured out rather than being dumb. Mm, I've had some dumb dogs. Well, sure. There is such thing as dumb dogs. <laughs> They're great. They're the best. There's dumb people too, so. Oh, well, sure. Dumb shrews, dumb camels, <laughs> dumb plants. Interesting point. Dumb everything. <laughs> uh, so in the case of the avalanche, you jump in the hole, and that's great. First first part accomplished. But then they'll do it again, but the person uh, handling the dog holds on to them for, say, five or ten seconds. Right. Then makes them go. Then they just increase that time up until the point where it's like five or ten minutes, and the person has buried themselves in the snow. And then the dog, like, that's the true test. Like, it's been ten minutes I saw the person go and disappear, and now, and I imagine this isn't very fun for the person to bury themselves in snow completely. Right. But it's got to be done, and then the dog finds a person, and they get that snossage or that frisbee play. Yep. And so each time they're associating this new thing, um, the, the increasingly complex game of find the human um, with their reward. So they're learning this this new stuff. Holding the dog back increases the amount of attention span and memory that's required to to remember this game. And so over time, the dog learns if I go dig under snow, I can find a person that I smell there and they'll probably play with me. Yeah. Um, again, depends on how soon the dog uh, was let off on the scent of the person covered by the avalanche. Sure. But that's what that's the game that they learn. Yeah, and and. They talk a lot about focus and concentration, but these dogs, I mean, it is amazing because in a in a lot of these searches, unless you're like you're the first one on the scene, mm -hmm. there are people everywhere. There are sirens. There are bullhorns. There's equipment making loud noises. There are any distraction you could think of that would freak a dog out yeah. is on the scene all at once. And they say that SAR dogs can get so good that they can not only ignore all this, but they could... <laughs> They could walk by a cheeseburger on a trail mm -hmm. and just keep following that scent. Yeah. Which is you, where my dogs would fail. You want to identify the SAR dog at a disaster area? Find the dog that's just casually filing its nails. Yeah. <laughs> that's the SAR dog every time. Yeah, there's no way my dogs would ignore the, the food thing. That would uh, be <laughs> no. no good. 
Momo's got this thing where her eyes get real big and kind of bug out of her head, and she, like, uses a paw to kind of, like, gently, like, tap you, like, hey, I'm right here. Yeah. You want to share some of that? <laughs> so um, there's a, a couple other things we should mention about this. This training, the avalanche training we just mentioned, you can you can do that with anything. You can do it with underwater training. Apparently, it involves the handler in the boat with the dog, but also a scuba diver hiding underwater. That's the best way to train dogs on water. Wow. Um, you can do it with um, simulated disaster, like collapse buildings, that kind of stuff. So you can take this this idea that you're training the dog that if they go look for a person, the person might give them their sausage or their ball, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. So even when they're out there searching for dead bodies in the woods to the dog, they're just playing a game. There's a bunch of people around. There's a lot of sirens and, like, crying humans and, um, like, shovels and and backhoes and all that stuff. But the dog's just, in the midst of all this, the dog is playing a game of go find it. Yeah, which is why that reward is so key, right? Uh, even in the face of tragedy. Yeah. So um, the, that's the dog training. We have to talk about training you, because in in Soviet Russia, SAR training <laughs> trains you. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, most of these SAR handlers uh, will will seek out this dog probably from the get go um, at a shelter and mm-hmm. kind of start from from day one as like this is my next SAR dog. Um, like we said earlier, they spend about a thousand hours of training as a human. Um, this is training the dog. This is also like, you've got to be good in the woods. You've got to know weather patterns. You got to know how to communicate on these radio comms and know how to work a compass. And, uh, most of these people are a lot of them are EMS certified, but at the very least you're brushed up very well on your CPR Uh because if you're a couple of miles away and you're the person that comes upon the scene, Mm -hmm. you've got to administer some, some aid right there. Yeah. One might call it first aid. <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> you got to look good in cargo pants. Yeah, oh, for sure. Uh, you got to have a nice pair of hiking boots. Got to be able to wear a boot. This article um, quotes a uh, search and rescue handler um, who who says the the chief thing that you have to be able to do is to know where you are at any given point during the search. Yeah. Um, you have to precisely identify your coordinates, which means you have to know that GPS, the compass, the map, all that stuff you said. But you also have to know it while you're following your dog with a flashlight at night because apparently at night is the best time for a dog to search. Crazy. So you have to be really, really good at at identifying your coordinates. And the reason why is because dogs will often um, give a sign. They'll alert that they found something even though there doesn't seem to be anything there. But if your dog does that, you want to note down the coordinates and you keep searching. And if some other SAR dogs come along and they they note the same area and everybody compares notes afterwards, there you're going to go back to that same area. Yeah. That that you need to know exactly where the area is so you know that there's something there and how to get back to it. Yeah. So you really need to know what you're doing with with um, self coordination is what I'll call it. Yeah, I would fail, even if Nico was great. Mm-hmm. My my legendary uh, sense of that poor sense of direction mm-hmm. would disqualify me. Yes. So that's why I don't do this. Didn't I, you get trapped in a cave once? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't get trapped. You just didn't feel like leaving. Uh, no. <laughs> what are you talking about? I went caving and I went in and I went out. Okay, there was no problems. I thought there was a problem. No, I mean the problems were. Uh, it was kind of scary. Right, but I, I was I was with experienced spelunkers, who who got me all through it. Sure, but yeah, that was that one pancake part that you freaked out when I even told you about it. Yeah, I don't want to talk about. It. <laughs> so, uh, if you are a SAR team or you have a SAR dog, mm-hmm. um, you are like you said on call at all times. Even if you're on vacation, that's why you travel with your dogs a lot. Um, you are always ready, and I imagine it could ruin a vacation. But if you're sitting around you know, pushing papers in an office, you you probably look forward to that call. Oh yeah. To get out in the in the woods and do what you were trained to do with your with your best pal. Yeah, exactly. So you get the call out, uh, you load up all your gear, you you head out there. Um it depends on what's going on. You might be hopping on a helicopter or a boat a- again, depending what's going on there. Um and this is where that obedience and all those distractions come into play. And you're you're, you know, 
it's up to you as the handler to be the alpha. Even though your dog needs to be good off leash and on loose leash, it's still you're still in charge. Right. And that's and that's a big part of it. So I, I think we said that search and um urban search and rescue is the, the hardest um kind of search and rescue for a dog to do. Not just because um it's it's difficult, but because it can be it can really get a dog down to find nothing but dead bodies. It's also extremely hazardous, you know, the dogs poking around a um a collapsed building. That's yeah. a precarious place to be looking for survivors. Um, so if you're an urban search and rescue dog, from what I saw, you don't want a dog that's over three years old entering this or uh, that, that's just too old. So you want a younger dog, you want to start training them early on. But if you're an urban um, search and rescue dog, urban disaster search and rescue, um, you're probably not going to have an extremely long career in that. It's just too exhausting and it's too demanding. So you may, as you as you kind of move toward retirement, um, get moved to different types of search and rescue that are a little less demanding. And apparently the last step before retirement is uh, wilderness search and rescue because to a dog, it's just a great day out in the woods. Sure. That's, it's as good as it comes. Yeah, so after, after four or five years on the scene of collapsed buildings, yep. you get to run around the National Forest and, uh, and look for folks. Yep, and then after you finally are retired, you get to lay around all day and chase those squirrels you've been wanting to chase that whole time. Yes, and unsurprisingly, um, I would say <clears throat> most all of the time you are probably sticking with the 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 trainer as their good boy or girl. But yep. e- if that is not possible for some reason, there are plenty of people that will line up to adopt a SAR dog. Oh yes. Because they are just as as um, well trained as they come. That's right. Uh, you got anything else? No, yeah, man. I, I I love these dog cats. Sar dogs. Yeah. I'd love to do something about just breeds and the original dogs and how they evolved and all that good stuff. Okay. Have we not done a how dogs works? I, I'm sure we have. Yeah, but I don't know if we got into all the. Uh, you know, there's that movie out about the uh, original dog, the original domesticated dog. Um, it's called Alpha. Uh, okay. No, and and I think not. it's not true, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think it may be based on what people believe might have happened, like one human bonded with one wolf, and that kind of started the whole thing. Are you talking about Dances with Wolves? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I have seen that. It was Waterworld. <laughs> right. I was way off. Oh, that's funny you bring that up. I was thinking about that movie the other day and just how perfect the casting of Dennis Hopper was. Because whoever sure. casted him was like, this movie's off the rails before we even started shooting. Yeah, let's get Dennis Hopper and Gary Busey in here. Was Gary Busey in it too? No, he, oh, okay. and I don't want to make fun of Gary Busey. He's no, you shouldn't. real troubles. So, well, way to end this on a downer. We'll just <laughs> stop right here. If you want to know more about SAR dogs, just start looking it up. There's all sorts of training resources and everything you could hope to find on the internet. Um, and since I said that, uh, it's time for listener mail. Uh, this is about Pando. Yes. Um, and I have to say that since we did that episode, I often listen to brown noise here at work while I'm trying to concentrate on my, my earbuds. But I have since switched to Aspen Forest. Oh, nice. And, and wind. There's a great, like, hour and a half recording of uh, in the field of a, it may be Pando for all I know, but it's really, really lovely. Highly recommended. Cool. So, uh, all right, here we go. Hey, guys uh, and Jerry. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Really enjoyed hearing your episode on Pando. My family's been taking an annual camping trip to Fish Lake, Utah, since the early to mid-90s, which is only a mile or two down the road from Pando. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you go a mile from Pando that's that big and just not go into Pando? (laughs) Right. You know? Maybe they don't know about Pando. (laughs) Oh, he knows. Oh. He said, I've been hearing stories about it since I was little and have always been astounded by the magnitude and resilience of an organism like that. Mm -hmm. The ungulate fences start right on the side of the road, and it's like night and day. Uh, You're driving along in a fairly sparse aspen grove, and then, bam, there's a wall of tall, dense aspens on one side surrounded by a fence. The other side of the road is a fence as well, but there's often cattle roaming, and the tree population is considerably thinner. Boo. (laughs) I'm an oil painter by trade and recently did a commission of a nice little spot in Pando, 
and included a little picture here in the email of the finished piece. Oh, cool. Uh, it is a wonderfully gorgeous place. Saddens me to hear how much uh, danger it's in. Thanks for getting the word out there, guys. Hopefully something can be done. Uh, hope all is well. That is from Lawson Barney in Colorado. Nice. And asked him if people could view his art, and he said, just go to Lawson Barney on Instagram, L-A-W-S-O-N, all one word, capital uh-huh. B-A-R-N-E-Y on Instagram to see some of his stuff. Yes. Uh, Instagram is a great place to find artists these days. That's what I hear. Uh, are, are you not on? No, no. You know me. You got to check it out. While you're there, check out um, an artist I love called uh, Christian Rex Van Minen. Ooh. Amazing. I'm going to check out Lawson Barney, too, at the very least because he's got a pretty awesome name. Yes. Uh, if you want to talk about artists that you love on Instagram, turn us on to some. You can go to our website, stuffyoushouldknow.com, find all of our social links. I also have a website called thejoshclarkway.com, and you can send us an email. Send it off to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 